be in the sixth chapter chapter of Ephesians tonight. This will be our seventy fifth lesson, and this will be the conclusion of the practical portion of this uh, book. When sin entered the world through Adam, it impacted the human race more than many people have imagined. A, what I call a beneficial awareness of divine qualities became obscure. How much knowledge people, Adam, had of God, we, we don't know. Prior to the uh, fall and the transgression, <clears throat> Adam was in a state of moral excellence and innocence. And he had, was endowed with a remarkable knowledge of things under the sun and a wisdom that functioned in the earthly domain. He knew how to tend the garden. He knew how to name the animals. He knew the function of a wife. However, there's no evidence in Scripture that he ever knew anything about God's eternal purpose or that he ever had any extensive knowledge of the person of God or that he ever had extensive exposure to God. There's no way, uh, so people think, well, I like to think this is true, but there's no evidence of this in Scripture. There's no indication that God ever divulged to Adam knowledge pertaining to his purpose or eternal life or the world to come or heaven. That was something he's going to make known to the second man and the last Adam. Amen. And there's no evidence in Scripture that God ever did share with Adam what he gave through Christ. I mean, it's pretty evident, actually, but it's kind of a new thought. <laughs> Which is all the more why these epistles have been written. As much as we may not like it, there's remnants of the of Adam that remain in us, and they are tremendously hindering influence. So that if you defer to them or are sympathetic to them, they'll set you back. I think Adam knew intuitively what the creation is said to clearly display, namely God's eternal power and Godhead. And I think that kind of summarize what Adam knew about God. I don't really know how he could have known anything else other than that, unless God divulged it to him. <coughs> following the fall, however, even that rudimentary knowledge is eternal power in God that following the fall, man lost, man lost that. This was because man is now alienated from God, and God won't let anyone who's alienated from him understand him. Amen. Amen. Is it something you got to know about God? You can't, like, study about God and learn about him through the normal rules of, of scholastic and academic rules. You, if you're alienated from God, there's a wall between the person and God, and they will not and cannot understand God. And it's pointless to try and explain God to them. The only thing you can really explain to them is Christ. That's, that's the only way they'll ever have any understanding, or anyone else will have any understanding of God. The truth of the matter is, however, that God made the worlds, plural, and humanity itself as a shadow and type of what he wanted men to know, both about himself and what he's doing. What he is going to accomplish in Jesus was by divine intention, by divine intention, paralleled in the natural relationships of humanity. To this point we've seen that the reality of the Son of God being given a wife is seen in 
man having a wife, Adam first and then man afterwards. See, that's why it's that's why it's arranged that way. I suppose God could have chosen another method to populate the race. I'm sure the angelic hosts weren't populated by that by that means. And the first flood of animals in the world weren't populated by that means. I'm, but he chose that means because it reflected a relationship he wanted men to know. And the fact that the Son of God would have offspring. That's reflected in the fact of, of children. And the fact that the Heavenly Father is, is a reality as seen in the earthly fatherhood of men. See, that reflects that truth. And the concept of God having servants. See, we've seen that that been depicted in earthly servile functions. Now we'll see that the fact of God being master, that has also been projected in human relationships. Uh, even though it's been obscured where that, where that fact is obscured, God's masterhood is obscured. We'll be in chapter 6, verse 9. And ye masters, do the same things unto them. For bearing threatening, knowing that your master, your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. <coughs> Ye masters. As someone is over their, some of their peers. Men aren't over angels. <laughs> it's over men. Now, Paul is not just outlining the ideal social relationships. That's, that's not what he's done. And such involvements are never the focus of Scripture. Like there's not an epistle written especially for how to conduct your families or how to conduct servile relationships. Or, this is not what God is making known. In this day of salvation, God always speaks to men with his character and his purpose being primary, and so that if you miss either one of those, like you missed what the scripture meant. God intends for men to seek him, find him, believe on his son, and prepare for judgment. That's God's overall strategy. No person can afford to preach or teach without due consideration of those matters. But there, but there is an enormous amount of preaching and teaching that they have nothing whatsoever to do with any of those things. If we allow ourselves to become absorbed with life in this world, we will inevitably neglect God's great salvation. I wish people would see that. I, I know a lot of people that are fine people according to appearance and they're likable and all this sort of thing and they're rather devoted and religious, but they just think too much about this world and its relationships. So I see more and more the necessity of steering, steering people up to see and acknowledge the truth. This is one of the main functions of the assembly. But see, people, the assembly is not very important today. They, uh, one brief gathering is pretty much suffice. But it will not suffice for what God's doing. Amen. We've got to be to the point where we, do, where we use the world, but don't abuse the world. As 1 Corinthians 7, 30 and 1, which is in the context, incidentally, of, of marriage. And that requires a continual building up, a continual exposure to sound doctrine because of the contrary influences that, with which you are barraged on a continual basis. You can't have Satan working 100% of the time to deceive you and you devoting about a hundredth of your time to, to profit. This will not work. 
Already Paul has associated the lives of husbands, wives, Hus uh, wives, husbands, children, fathers, and servants, he's associated them with the living God. Do you remember, I'm sure, what he said? He said to wives, they're to live as unto the Lord. So he brought the Lord in there. Husbands are to mirror the relationship of Christ and the church in their association with their wives. Children are to obey their parents in the Lord. Fathers are to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants are to serve their masters in seeking the heart as unto Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So he's, he's taken the normal activities of life, and he said these have got to be lived unto the Lord. Otherwise, to state it as mildly as I can, the odds are against you ever being saved. Is that, is that serious? So thank God that he's arranged things so this could be done. Amen. What if these various functions of life had no real association with the living God? It would be exceedingly difficult, see, mm -hmm. to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But, they, but you can do these domestic responsibilities as unto the Lord. Amen. So maintain and maintain your spiritual life. Uh, some, some men have decided that they can sidestep this and just go live, you know, like in a, in, a, in the woods somewhere, yeah. and they can get away with not doing this. But see, that won't work. No, it will not. It just it won't. This has been designed to teach us something when we do them to the Lord. Amen. Now let's look at this word masters. Masters, ye masters. He's talking to the church now, so some of these people are in the church. Masters. Mm -hmm. Other versions read employers, slave owners, or lords. The academic definition of master is he to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has power of deciding, master or lord. That the master has power of deciding. The possessor and disposer of a thing, the owner, one who's in control of the person. That's what master means. Interestingly enough, the word, Greek word translated master is kurios, which is translated lord and is consistently applied to both God and Christ. Yeah, right. But the same word's applied here. So there's the Lord or the Master, and then there's a there's a Master and a Lord. That has to do with human relationships. Now all of this is designed to teach people the truth about God. The truth is God is not your friend. Yeah, that's right. Amen. That's not what he is. He's your master. That's what he is. <laughs> now it may appear to the American mind that it may not appear to the American mind that master slave is a good association of Christ and his God and his people. It has kind of a bad connotation to it. So much so that translators wrestle with should we use slave or servant? Because if we use slave, people are going to think back when they owned slaves. But see, that's the whole point. That's the point of a master. He did own the slave. Sometimes he bought the slave. Now that is the point. So then what's happened? Now I'm not advocating slavery, you understand. But I'm saying it's questionable whether the abdication of slavery really did anything beneficial. It would have been better, it seems to me, to ensure that the masters conducted themselves properly. And then we could understand this text a little bit more. But this is not an American text. <laughs> Somebody thinks of the word master, they usually think of someone who's over dealing harshly 
with those who are under him, but a master doesn't have to be harsh. That's right. Like, we, we keep our body in subjection. We are master over our own body, but we're never unduly harsh to it. Yeah. That doesn't mean that we have to be harsh and cruel, and that, that's that's not what God is. God, I would say, yeah, I would say physically harsh or cruel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we do have to be harsh with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, God's the epitome example of yeah. that because he's mm -hmm. he's not harsh to us unless we are straying from the way and yeah. need correction, or we're do, we're doing something wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, in view of this relationship, master, slave, Paul addresses a word to the masters. He says, "Do the same things." Unto them. <laughs> the other versions say, Treat your slaves in the same manner, or treat your slaves with respect, or act the same way toward what's, what's the same way? What's he talking about? Treat them the same way. What is same? What is that same way? That's the way what he has to do with what he said to slaves. He said, Doing the will of God from the heart. As to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that whatsoever good thing a many man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, neither be he bond or free. Masters, that goes for you too. Yeah, amen. You, <laughs> you live that way too. You do the same thing unto them. You treat them with a mind to pleasing God. Yes, amen. Like they are to serve you with a mind to pleasing. Yeah. Well, this is revolutionized, of course, the business world and even the church world and the religious world is it revolutionizing see everyone is to live with understanding their primary relationship to the Lord everybody particularly in the body of Christ everyone is to live with that in mind no one is free from that no position whether servile or managerial can be lived without due regard for the Lord all the time in all the relationships they have with their either subordinates or their rulers. This applies to adults and children. This applies to husbands and wives and it applies to servants and owners and children and parents. Those who are in some way subordinate Wives, children, slaves are not to be deprived of any advantages of being in Christ. Amen. Nobody in Christ takes a lower position in Christ because they're a wife or because they're a child or because they're a slave. Yes. It's just it's not the way the kingdom of God operates. Furthermore, no one who has an upper position, husbands, fathers, masters, has any spiritual advantage because of that circumstance. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> it is good to know. This principle applies to spiritual leaders too. As taught by Peter, well, Peter and Paul, those who are leading the flock are not free from doing so as unto the Lord, and the flock is not free from obeying them as unto the Lord. It's this spirit or attitude that causes the effective unity of the spirit. I don't know how you could have the unity of the spirit, the unity of the faith, if the, <coughs> if the slave sat over here and the master sat over here and the husband sat over here, and the wives sat over here, and the children went to the back room. How could you promote the unity of the spirit and the unity of the faith? How could you convey the nature of salvation under a circumstance like that? And yet it exists all over the globe. See, because the physical, whether you want it or not, who or not, the physical circumstance does kind of reflect the spiritual perception that a person has. Amen. Amen. If he says, well, now, right now, the men are going to pray, 
So the, the women need to go to the kitchen at this time. Or we're going to be dealing with a kind of a sensitive issue in the assembly today, so no one under 18 should be here. This happens now. I'm talking about stuff that happens. I'm not making this up. But see, this this destroys this destroys what Paul's teaching here. This says that such the circumstance, the status of people do not reflect the status of Christ in the church, but it does. And so it has to be conducted with that in mind. The masters do the same things. What I told a servant supplies to you too. But he's going to tailor it. He's going to tailor it for him. See, he what he did with with wives, with husbands and children and fathers. He tailored it. And servants, he tailored it for their circumstance. So he tells the master, who's the head, you know, forbear threatening, knowing that your master's in heaven. See, each of the persons addressed have been given something to do. Yeah. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives. He's given them something to do. Love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Servants, be obedient to the married master. So everyone is given something to do. It's, it's just not a philosophy. It's just not something you sit around and think about. You do this. You live this out. Yeah, that is the great missing factor in the, the Babylonian religion. What is believed is not lived out. What is said to be believed is not lived out. But here, it's lived out. Brother, you know, it's more important that we actually do this right. than we wear a symbol. Mm -hmm. That would indicate that we that that's we what, are this way. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't put on a mask when they come in. Mm -hmm. that's right. Now, there's a sense in which the spiritual lives are common to, to all, but spiritual life has to be maintained. Mm -hmm. That's that's the point Paul is making. It has to be maintained. It's just not important that you have eternal life. It has to be maintained. See, eternal life isn't like eternal existence. You can't die. It, that's not what it is. Eternal life is sustained by bread from heaven. Yeah. It continues on. You possess it, see. It, it, and so he's teaching us one way to maintain this spiritual life is to live out every facet of life unto God. Whatever you do with your wife or your husband or your child or your father or your servant, whatever you do and whenever you do it, you've got to be conscious now God's watching what I'm doing here. I'm going to have to give an account for what I'm doing in the day of judgment and I want to be able to do it with joy. See, I conducted my life as unto you, God. You know I did. I did it because I learned from you to do it. <coughs> now, those who occupy a higher station in life, in society, are reminded that there's no special allowances for them to act out of harmony with. <laughs> yeah, perhaps you've worked with someone that, even in religious circles, that uh, didn't know this. Yeah. So what's he tell them? Forbear threatening now. Forbear threatening. Give up threatening. New King James says, stop threatening. New Revised Standard says, not making use of violent words, basic Bible. Don't try and scare them, living Bible. Stop bullying. New American Bible. Give up threatening and using violent and abusive words. Stop that practice. Stop motivating people by scaring them. Well, the word threaten means to declare that one will cause harm to someone, particularly if certain conditions are not met. If you do that, I'll forbear threatening. Let's seek a higher constraint than that. 
Well, I understand that sometimes with children you have to do this. Mm -hmm. I understand that, but that shouldn't be the default mm -hmm. method. I'll thrash you within an inch of your life. Do you do that? Well, it may come to the where you have to say that, but that's not the that's not your first <laughs> your first alternative. Why not? Because you've got to learn, brethren, to be sensitive. No person is naturally sensitive. It's kind of something you have to learn. One way to do is forbear. Through. Let's just say I, I, my immediate reaction is, oh, but I'm going to seek a better method. I, I don't want God to be like this with me, so I'm going to, I'm going to seek a better method. And maybe it'll help clarify how God is toward me, and maybe the situation can be resolved with a better method. I may have to resort to that, but it'll be, it'll be the last. It won't be the. It'd just be if I had a wayward servant on my hands. Forbear threatening. Now this is quite common, isn't it? Motivating those who are under your care by threats. Now, in addressing masters, Paul's not addressing society in general, although the, the rules apply to all masters, but that's not who he specifically is talking about, talking to. He's speaking to members of the Ephesian church. I don't doubt that there was a tendency some master had a lot of slaves tend to be kind of ruthless and demanding. And He said, forbear threatening, kill that, kill that inclination. And he tells, he tells slaves, they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, because they are brethren, but rather let them do, do them service because they are faithful and beloved and partakers of the benefits. So you see, he's, he's trying to develop a spiritually congenial relationship yeah. between slaves and masters. Now, how's that for a task? How, yeah. how would you like to be charged with that? That's what he's doing. All life must be lived for the Lord, or none of it can be lived for Him. Uh, I want to be dogmatic at this point, because God demands all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. So if all of your life is not being lived for God, none of it is. Not even that sanctified time when you're in church. It's all one big fat waste of time. God won't accept part-time servants. Why not? Well, he's working full-time on your salvation. Christ is working full-time on your salvation. Holy Spirit's working full-time on your salvation. Holy Spirit's working full-time on your salvation. What would lead any person to think they could just invest a portion of their time in it? Yes. Yes, God is, is uh, consistent in everything and at every time. So those that are joined to him, they participate in this quality of consistency. Yes, yes, amen. Very good. Mm -hmm. It seems simple. Once you see it, it seems simple, yeah. doesn't it? But, well, with some of us, it took quite a while to <laughs> break through the crust of carnality and see this. Yes, Brother Bob. Are you going to run across the argument at this point that, that Paul made a mistake here? He should have told them to let the slaves go. Yeah. <laughs> but see, he doesn't do that. In fact, he sent one slave back. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, no one would object being a slave if they were treated right. That's right. At least no person in sound mind. And we live with an employer-employee -empl relationship, which is the same thing. And we've said that employer bought your time. And none of us have any objection working for someone who treats us considerately, us considerately or, or as one serving the Lord. Who, In fact, that's a kind of a blessing. Yes, it is. You have a manager that's a believer, that's like a double blessing. But if you don't, you still serve him. Amen. And he's got and he's got his responsibilities yeah. too. 
Now here was a social convention, master-slave, that was exploited by many people. <laughs> Indeed, it appeared on the surface as though it could be exploited without penalty. You just do it. You beat him or whatever. That some people thought that slaves or employees can be treated like servile beasts. That's what they think. And they can appear to justify, we, we paid for the person. We're paying your salary. So we say no lunch break. Huh? We say you got to stay over at your own expense. So I worked at one on, under this condition. I worked, I, I was a salaried person. I, and uh, so if a dignitary from the managerial headquarters came from New York, to, I had to escort him from when he left work till when he went to his hotel, which sometimes is like four or five hours. I had to escort him at my expense. And if I didn't, I lost my job. Well, I learned to do that and commit Give it to the Lord, said, <laughs> vengeance is mine, I'll repay, saith the Lord. And I did live to see some of the people repaid. But that was God's business. See, some people think they can exploit this, but Paul, Paul right to the church says, no. There is no such thing as one man having the opportunity and right to exploit somebody else. We're really dealing with a, we're going over it in different circumstances, but the principle is being revisited at each time. I mean, mm -hmm. every single, every single thing he's talked about here, there are some people who think they can be yeah. uh, hateful and mean to their children because mm -hmm. they're children. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? They're powerless against them. Yeah. And so they're, they really are yeah, bad to their children mm -hmm. and neglectful. Uh, we live in a world where wives are treated like chattel. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're nothing. And whenever yeah. they're used up, you get rid of them and get another one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, th this is the hardness of man's heart yes, amen. being addressed amen. in these different, um, these different mm -hmm. relations of mm -hmm. life to show the righteousness and goodness of God as it's uh, juxtaposed to the the fallen nature of man and how that in redemption mm -hmm. that nature has been re uh, well it, it's been redeemed amen mm -hmm. now when when we read um, a proscription like this forbear threatening I've heard Christian people Christian leaders talk about obedience as something that's kind of chafes against us chafes against the person. You know how it is. We just don't want to. You know how we are. When God tells us we just buck against it, we don't want to do it. And This is being preached, and some people think this is really true, but it's not. Yeah. You'll find that when God says don't, you actually feel better when you don't. Amen. There's something about obeying God that brings a blessing to the soul. Yeah. Yes. Became a believer, I, I did hear people say stuff like, you know, we're just like those Israelites. And yeah. we, but it wasn't until I understood this that we have an old man that we have to fight against, that mm -hmm. we have to put on the armor of God. It wasn't until I found out that, yeah, there, there's some things that your flesh wants to do, but you don't have to go with that. You're not, you're not a slave to sin. And then I realized, then I, you know, because I had a desire, I wanted to please the Lord, but then I had this part of me that just, and I didn't know that. So until somebody told me that, I had a problem with this because I was just like, well, there is a part of me that is, mm -hmm. you know, I struggle with. And then when I was set free, when I realized 
Brother Rick, you was the first one to tell me this. So you have an old man and a new man. Well, that was revelation to me. I said, yeah. oh, well, I don't have, you know, you're free to live righteous and holy. And just because something comes across, I remember Brother Ricky, I'm saying it this way, just because it comes across your desk doesn't mean you have to take hold of it. You can just put it in a trash can. Because, you, you know, your old man, it, there's things, thoughts and stuff, cast them away. That's right. Now, when, you, when a person resolves, to serve the Lord with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that, that there comes a time that that resolve has to be made. Yeah. You just can't ass, assume that this is the case. You have to resolve it. When, it, yeah. when you do, it sensitizes your soul. Yes. So when you obey what God says to do, it like builds you up. Yes. There's a joy and a confidence. When you are wayward, it knocks you down, makes you feel oppressed. Now, but it's the person who says enough to see this, but you can you can detect this. Yes, brother Jim. That was that was something that really happened to me. Was I got this confidence? I was like, yeah, I can say no. Yeah. And then after you continue walking with the Lord, then some things got easier. Then you got other things come along, but. There are some, uh, some things at first that was hard, but you got to build up this confidence. In. Amen. You going to say anything for there? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, I, uh, before we're threatening, knowing. See, the new covenant life is lived by faith within the scope of knowledge. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> person who doesn't know anything really... If they have faith, it's, it's very little. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is very important in the kingdom of God. Knowing, very important. Mm -hmm. Now, he's not referring to knowing like re remembering a collection of facts like mathematical facts or historical facts. It's kind of in the back of your mind you have this storehouse of knowledge. That's not what he's talking about here. The Holy, the Holy Spirit used the word knowing. He's referring to it in the sense of active present awareness. This is a kind of knowledge that causes an adjustment yeah. in your attitudes or your objectives or your expressions. And I'll give you some samples of this kind of knowledge. Knowing that tribulation work is patience. All right, this just doesn't mean I know that's in the Bible. <laughs> This adjusts the way you live, so you don't try and uh, avoid tribulation. You don't compromise your stand for Christ in order to avoid opposition, because, because you know this. Here's another, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That's what brother, that, this is what Brother Jeremy was just talking about. It's one thing to sense these inclinations you would rather not have, but when you know it's coming from a crucified man, now that's another matter. Yeah. Knowing. Here's another thing. When you're suffering, knowing this, knowing in yourselves that you have in, your, in heaven a better and enduring substance. So here you are, you're losing things for one reason or another. I've lost resources for variety of reasons, but those, some people had it taken from them, just forcibly taken from them. And it might, so all that time I spent, I accumulated those goods with honest endeavors. I bought them with good, honest money. I meant to use them for the Lord. Here they're all taken away. What am I going to do? Knowing you have a better and enduring substance in heaven enables you to adapt to that otherwise very untasteful situation. Amen. Distasteful situation. Knowing that the trying of your faith works patience or endurance. So here you're put to the test where it's hard to make up your mind. That's, that's the kind of test we're talking about. It's hard to make up your mind. You've got a couple of alternatives. Yes, you know theoretically I shouldn't. You know, I, I shouldn't, but there's this compulsion. Some people give in to it. They ignore 
Uh, the caution light, the yellow caution. Well, don't go through here. Don't go through here. You have a collision. When you know that tr the trying of your faith works patience, then you know if I can, I'll be stronger if I yield to my, to the higher motivation, to the to the inclination of the new man. If I yield to this, I know I'll be able to endure, no matter how long the trial is. Or how about this? Well, that was about in my head. This kind of knowing must be present at all times. This is not the kind of knowing you reach in your, you reach up in the library and pull the volume out. This, you're living with this knowledge. This knowledge is an active awareness. Elevated above the scene realm, so you're living with a heightened acute awareness of things right. that aren't seen. That's right? right, and that becomes your default. That's right. Like when uh, when Joshua yes. Caleb came back from the land, they saw the same things the other spies. That's seen. right. The other spies said, "We can't take it." That's right. I mean, they looked at the same thing, but they also knew we are well able. God's oh, yeah. God's already said, "Give us the land," and so yeah. that was their default. Mm -hmm. See, but whatever men have been living towards yeah. is going to be their default in these critical test times. Amen. Like that, right? Right. Now, I think most of you have actually experienced this and know what this is. Mm -hmm. What this is about. It's refreshing to know yeah. to know this. <clears throat> in this epistle, in his epistle to the Colossians, <clears throat> Paul says to masters, "Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal." Or employers, give to your employees that which is just and equal, knowing that it's also ye have a master in heaven. So, a church employs a minister <laughs> and expects him to live on the kind of wages that puts you in Souls Harbor. They got no business hiring a preacher. Now let the elders that labor in the word and the doctrine be kind worthy of double honor. That was what he's talking about, payment. That's right. mm -hmm. You'd be surprised if you work for a Bible college, mm -hmm. we just pay half the living wage. Mm -hmm. Masters, this is a word here. The guy, he, he means this. Give that which is just and equal. Don't be hiring somebody and giving them a below living wage. That's how sensitive God is, see? <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate this. Don't try and get a bargain out of your brethren now. May be tempted to do it. May be tempted. Brother Bob, he's a, he's a good worker. He does specialized work. Uh, he'll, he'll prefer to do it for nothing, but that's a decision he should make. Not <laughs> We shouldn't make it. We shouldn't say, well, uh, if you could cut the price in half, we'd be... Give that which is just and equal. <laughs> Masters are to know that it is the nature of the Lord to deal with men in accordance with truth. He himself is pure toward them that are pure, forward toward them that are forward. If men do not forgive those who sin against them, he won't forgive them for sinning against him. Just and equal. Aim for everybody. By the same token, those who resort to threats to motivate them that are under them They'll confront threats by their master in heaven. That's how God will manage them then. Because what you sow, you reap. Intimidating language when dealing with those who are under us is not, is not proper. If you ever use, have to use threatening language, then you've got to carry it out. And it's just when th the person's wayward or recalcitrant. On a lower yet very practical level, Jesus said, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even to them. 
for this is the law and the prophets. So if you don't like to be treated in such a way, don't you be treating other people that way. Yeah. I remember when I was uh, put in a managerial position, I was over a lot of people that formerly used to make fun of me and agitate me and things like this. But I asked the Lord to help me to be the kind of manager I would like to work for. And the Lord enabled me to do this, and I never did have any trouble with employees. Never did. Masters, see, that, that, that's the principle of master, just right down to everyday life. Yeah. Now, remember your masters in heaven, uh, neither is there any respect to persons with him. Yeah. Now, notice that Paul puts the masters in mind of the character of God. <laughs> now this is how God is. He doesn't say there is a God. Boy, he says something about God that pertains to the situation. See, this is what a good, a good preacher and a good teacher will take the word of God and apply it to the situation at hand. Or shall we say use. He will use the scriptures profitably. Using the word of God. <clears throat> because the the awareness, willing awareness of the nature of God becomes a strong incentive yeah, right. to do what he says. Whether it's that he fulfills his promise, he's good to them that love him, or so forth, or whether he, if you threaten, he, he sees that too. The knowledge of God, see, it's a key. In this case, the knowledge of God is there's no respect of persons with God. So you can be sure. You can be sure. He's not going to allow you to have respect of persons. Yeah. Not if he doesn't have respect of persons. See, it's when men forget God, that's when they fall into sin. When they forget who God is, and his character, when they forget it, they fall into sin every time. Neither is there any respect of persons. Neither. Let's look at that word neither. Other versions use the word and. Which it is translated a number of times that way. And. Now this word adds force to what's being said. It's what we call a coordinating conjunction. It takes two things and it puts them together. Except it puts them together like this. So that the matter becomes more weighty. So he's piling up spiritual weight to the argument that he's given. There's no respect of persons with him. Not, on, not only is he your master, but there's no respect of persons with him. So that makes the matter even more weighty yeah, yeah. than it was before. Right. <laughs> Other versions, versions read, there's no partiality with him. No favoritism. No respect for a man's position. No acceptance of persons, Darby says. He doesn't play favorites, God's Word Bible says. No mere earthly distinctions, Weymouth says. He does not discriminate. He judges everyone by the same standard. He makes no distinction between master and man. <laughs> or master and servant, be it, well, how I would say it. Now this aspect of God is repeated through scripture. I give you some instances where it says God's no respecter of persons. He comes over this several times. But what does that mean? He is no respecter of persons. See elsewhere it says the Lord had respect unto Abel. Yeah. What, what are you going to do with that? And Exodus 2.25, God looked upon Israel and had respect. Yeah, right. <laughs> there it is. Unto them. 2 Kings 13, 23, the Lord was gracious unto them and had respect unto them. Psalm 38, 6, yet had he respect unto the lowly. We also read of God setting his love on some, choosing some, rejecting others. All right, how do you fit that in with this? God has no respect to persons. 
The key here is person, not respect. The individual's person is who they are by nature. It includes their own achievements and where they stand in the strata of humanity. It's who they are without God in the picture. See? God does not respect husbands above wives. No respect of persons. God does not respect fathers above children. And God does not respect masters above servants. No respect of persons. Their earthly identity doesn't shape what God thinks of them. Amen. It's an important thing to see now. Because there's people that battle and fight for an earthly recognition. They'll do anything for this. They'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal. They'll form coalitions with people that aren't good to give them an earthly advantage. Mm -hmm. But the, you can't gain an advantage with God yeah. Amen. by that means at all. Amen. God will not be lenient with fathers, but strict with children. No respect of persons. God will not allow a lot of liberty for the husbands, but not for the wives. No respect of persons. God will not allow masters to not please him, but servants have to please him. No, no respect of persons. God will hear the prayers of Cornelius because they are properly motivated, while he rejects the prayers of Israel because they were sinful. Right? Mm -hmm. No respect to persons. Turning is a Gentile. Mm -hmm. God always respects the work that he has done in an individual. Amen. That's, yeah, right. that's important to know. Yeah. Whether he did it in a wife or a husband or a father or a child or a servant or a master, he respects the work Amen. he's done in that person. God always he creates them in Christ Jesus, and he respects that creation. So if a woman comes to the door and says he's risen, you should really listen. You should listen. <laughs> See, God gives people to believe, so he respects them for believing. Amen. God teaches them to love one another, so he respects them. It's not their persons, it's his, it's his work that he's respecting. God hasn't done any work in the person. Well, that, that's <laughs> well. That's a, you don't want to be in that state. No. <laughs> Where these things are found, God's inclined to the individual. He accepts them. Mm -hmm. He upholds them. And those are all responses he dictated by distinction. He mm -hmm. gave it to this person, didn't give it to that person. And he does all this without respect mm -hmm. of persons. Yeah, God will forgive men of their sin, but he will not acquit it mm -hmm. or overlook it. He will not ignore the sin of a Christian, but focus on the sin of a sodomite. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No respect to persons. God loves every person alike, as some allege then he's a respecter of persons because he loves people that are ungodly. Yeah, that's right. uh -huh. This isn't God's nature. Mm -hmm. This would make him a respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. But he's not a respecter of persons. You can see that, can't you? Mm -hmm. Amen. Not a respecter of persons. If God receives us, even though we may commit the same sins as others do, then he's respecting our person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> Now, I don't see how a person can escape from this, but I know some would probably try. Mm -hmm. He will not conduct himself contrary to his nature by really loving those he elsewhere says he hates mm -hmm. or loathes or are an abomination to him. They would have respect to persons. 
If the risen Lord receives those who are lukewarm, while declaring he'll spew them out of his mouth, he's a respecter of persons. Can, can you see that? Because <laughs> they're a member of the first church. That's, that's good enough for me. Well, it may be good enough for you, but it's not good enough for God. In the case of masters, they are to treat fellow masters. They are not to treat fellow masters with dignity, but slaves with disdain. They are to be mindful of their lowly status and give them every possible righteous advantage, not exacting of them more than what is right. See, God saved Onesimus the slave, and he saved Paul the zealot, huh? who was a free man, apparently. He was born a free man. Remember he said, I was born free. He, was a, he had freedom. He was a free man in the Roman society. Onesimus was a slave. God saved them both, showing that he's not a respected person. Now, in professed Christian circles, there's a, there's a lot of respected persons. There are religious cliques in nearly every religious institution. And whether or not you're successful is determined by if you can get in that clique or not. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've seen some really fundamentally ignorant people that were accepted by the clique, mm -hmm. and some very astoundingly intellectual and thinking people were rejected by the clique. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. But these are glaring contradictions of both the nature and demands of God. Mm -hmm. Whoever among men there's respect of persons, it assists in clouding the fact that God is not a respecter of persons. Yeah. See, that condition, that, that's an environment in which you're living. You're living in an environment where, th where there is respect of persons, and you've got to break through that to see that God is not a respecter of person. You'll not do much for God until you know he's not a respecter of persons. That's just the way it works. Well, a wise piece of counsel, was it not, to the, <laughs> to the masters? This is, this is read publicly, you know. This was not a private communication. <laughs> Any of you have anything you'd like to add tonight? It yes. It seems to me like the, the, the worst respect for a person is when a person overlooks their own sin. And, and you know, and, and they think, well, but God loves me, and God, you know, He, because He is respecting your person more than His person. Yeah. You're 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 thinking more highly of yourself well, than no. you ought to, and and, and so it, it complicates the matter. If you if you see if you see somebody else do something, and that that's a that's terrible, but you excuse it when you do it. Well, yeah. you're the same that's thing. right. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, brother. Yes, Sister Annie. Um, on the lines of Brother Bob, when you spoke of that, I was reminded of the parable of the publican and the Pharisee. That's right, how amen. <laughs> the publican, he was very humble, but the Pharisee was very prideful, and the great difference that was between their prayers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen, and their acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. Judah? This one you were speaking of knowing. I've been preparing an introduction for your sermon on Sunday, and... I was thinking along these lines that knowing and having assurance fit together perfectly. Yeah, amen. They're synonymous. I mean, if we if we could go through the back through the recording and replace every time you said knowing or to know or something that pertained to that and replaced it with something like having assurance or being assured of, it would have made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So we can't be assured of something we don't know. That's fit right. Together perfectly. Amen. Mm -hmm. Others tonight? Yes, Brother Mike. I like that the the Spirit puts this one little word in here. Also, yeah, is knowing that your yeah. master also, also is in there. Yeah. It's kind of an equalizer. Yes, yeah, right. the same the same master of the wife and the master of the yes, husband. Amen. He's, he just as you pointed out in the beginning, amen. he's pointing out. Uh, he's saying to all these yeah. different groups of people to live unto the Lord. The, the wife and the husband and the children and the father and and the slave and so the the same same one that's master over them is 
also that's your master. Yeah, that's you know, good. It's kind of a, an equalizer, and of course, in the day of judgment, it will be. Amen. 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 Also, I, I was thinking about uh, when you were talking about <clears throat> uh, obeying the Lord. There's a it demonstrates the difference between obeying and being obedient. You can mm. a person can actually be disobedient and obey at least, <laughs> at least some of the time. Uh -huh. Sooner or later, they're going to disobey if they're disobedient. Uh -huh. But being being obedient is more like describing. It's part of the knowing. That's what you were talking That's about. Right. Knowing. Amen. Uh, Amen. Being obedient means that you're you're working with God. You're willing and knowing and understanding. Amen. That's your nature. Yeah. Yes, yeah. your nature Amen. is to Amen. obey. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way you've arranged humanity and the various relationships in it. We pray for grace to behold these relationships and conduct our lives always in view of yourself and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we express uh, gratitude for your kindness toward us, your consideration. And you do not resort to threatening, but give us promises as a great incentive. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.